Josh Reed Jones. Welcome to Roll with the Punches. Thanks for having me. How exciting. Isn't it exciting? Do you know what's most exciting? What? This time round, I know that I know you. That's right. Yeah, you remembered me this time. <laughs> like that. How embarrassing is that? It's not too it's not too embarrassing. I've got one of those sort of regular people faces. I think it's easy to it's easy to get lost in the in the sea of faces that no, we see all the time. The funny thing though, for everyone listening that's going, what, what are they talking about? So I recently had Josh Reed Jones on the U Project with mm-hmm. Harps and I kept thinking and it got progressively more familiar as we went on. By the end, I got off and I was like, I don't have a Google. Like, how do I know Josh's face so well? Like, he must be super famous and I just know him from places. Which, of course, and, I am. <laughs> and then I was like, <laughs> <laughs> of course. But I was like, I think he might, I think he might have once trained at the same boxing gym as me. <laughs> Yeah, trained at the same boxing gym, CrossFit, St Kilda PCYC, CrossFit St Kilda, CrossFit Balaclava, yeah. William Street Gym, Roy. I mean, everybody in the in the vicinity, you know, so it's a small world. <laughs> like, Your hair was different though, so I've got an excuse for not recognising you <laughs> first up. Hey, I get punched really hard way too often in the face, so that's my excuse and I'm sticking with it. I'm yeah, sticking that's a with good it. excuse. That's a good excuse. had a terrible memory before that. It's almost like I chose that sport to cover up my bad memory. I, I think it's okay. These days, you know, we, we, we see so many people. There was a brief period of time where I was moving around a lot for work and um, not to live, but like I was traveling a lot for work, sorry, and uh, and then people, I'd go to events and I'd do these things and then people would add me on Facebook. And actually for a while, that was quite useful because Facebook is always like people's first and last names mm-hmm. and they would have their photos of them. And, that, you know, this was, let's you know, say, 10 years ago when people were using it a little bit differently and maybe a little bit more. And so then when I'd go back to Darwin or I'd go back to Townsville or, and I would be able to be like, oh, good day, Pete, like because I've seen Pete's face a bunch of times. Now I'm like, hey, I'm chair 77. Fuck, I have no <laughs> idea what your name is. You know, like I just... I kind of vaguely <laughs> recognize the Instagram handle maybe or whatever, but it's like very different. So it's hard, it is hard to remember people's names, you know? All right. Well, here's how bad I am. I've got two examples for you and they're both William Street Gym related. So just before this last coming out of lockdown, which was has been a nice long one, I feel like we're back to never being locked down again, which is great. Prior to that, I was taking classes at William Street and Cy, shout out to Cy, so he's got this check-in system. So you book your class, you come in, and the trainer checks you off when you come. Now I've also trained as a as a you know participant at that gym for years, as you know, since two thousand and seventeen. And and the classes have probably twenty to sometimes thirty people in them, and all faces that I know, all people that I know, and we have to check them off. But they don't come to the desk and go, hey, I'm here. You just one minute you're there, you turn around, there's 30 people in, you've got to start the class and you've got to make sure that you tick off the names that are booked with the, with the faces that are there. And I was just, it was actually a state of heightened anxiety for me because once you, when you know someone and there were some people that they would tell me then, I would keep asking their names and then it just gets to the point where you're like, I'm never going to remember. I'm never, ever, it's been years and I will never, ever remember because I've got myself in such an anxious state about it that yeah. I'm in the anxiety when I'm trying to remember, which is not a great state to be in to try and remember things. And then there was once in lockdown when I went for a walk nearby through the botanical gardens and I had my headphones on and I was in the zone, you know, I was just, and I'd, there was another guy walking and kind of glanced and I didn't, I didn't recognise him, but I also wasn't looking to recognise. But I could feel him walk over and kind of walking hurriedly behind me, and and near me. And I was like, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to look and say hello. So I have to take my headphones off, and he and he starts chatting, and I'm like, oh, this is weird. And he's like, do you mind if I walk with you? And he's like, how are you going? I'm like, oh, I think this guy knows me. I don't know where from. And it was somebody who. I, who was doing my classes at William Street Gym, and I had no idea for most of that walk. That's uh, that's that's usually my go-to if in public is to just go roll with it until I until my brain catches up, and then go all right, yep, yeah, now I've clocked who this is, which is good. Sometimes you don't, and uh, it's nice when people introduce themselves and go, oh, I'm so and so from so and so, or I've seen you do this, and you go, okay, that's that really helps because uh, you know many years of meeting a lot of people. 
Yeah. Uh, sometimes I do forget. <laughs> yeah. And you've got like work and sport and like, well, you've got a whole bunch of different gyms we've trained at. So I've worked at different gyms and then trained at different gyms and then been an amateur fighter. So, but, you know, you just get this huge network of names and faces. Yeah. Too hard. And it's then just difficult. social media. The trick I used to do when we to check people into the gym would be like to just pull the um, you know, the iPad up or whatever, and just hold it and just shout names out and just tick them. I wouldn't even look up. I'd just be like, guys, I just need to get this done. How are you? Know, peak man, blah blah. And then you go, cool. Like no one's offended. I haven't looked around, and I just can't be bothered. And then every now and then you're like, Glenn, who the fuck? You might just quickly pop up. That's Glenn, right? Okay, blah 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 blah. But it is much easier when the names are there to check them into a class than to have to write names. Back back in the day, we used to write the names down on a piece of paper of who came in. That was even worse because at least you can check off the five people you do know for sure. Then you've got another 15. You're like, I'm pretty sure that's Sarah. <laughs> and you kind of, by process of elimination, you end up with the last couple, wait and suss their names out during the class and, and then tick them off. But when you had to write them on a bit of paper, that was, uh, yeah, I was terrible at that. Shocking. <laughs> I did an improv workshop. Um, <laughs> do you know what improv is? As in acting improv? Yeah, right. Yeah, I, did, I didn't yeah. know until I had an improv dude on my show and was like, that's a weird thing to do. This no, it's great fun. You should, you should Pretending. Everyone, everyone, should, everyone should do that. It's good. Yeah, so I went from thinking he was a weirdo to going, I definitely need to do that. So I went and did a workshop and we rock up and there were 18 people in the class and we have to do this name learning exercise. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, God, I'm not going to remember names. I went back the next week and I remembered all but one, but I could remember what letter their name started with. But I could, nearly all of them, a week later. But it's not a tact that I could practice because, you know, we had we went around the circle and you had to give, so I was like terrific Tiffany and you had to associate a movement with it. Oh, so yeah. You would do the, the word and the name and the movement and then everyone would copy and we did that a bit. And, but it was like, you're not going to do that, at, you know, you're going to do that at a party, are you? <laughs> no, it's very difficult. In class, you know, you've got, you got uh, overhand Oscar and, you know. <laughs> Right hook Ralph and left hand Larry. What would <laughs> you left, be, Josh? Left Larry. What would you be? Oh, I don't know. Jo jovial Josh. J is a bit of a weird one, isn't it? There aren't, I feel like it's not a great letter of the alphabet, J. Uh, <laughs> Could be jumping. Jolly Josh. Must, must be nice, Josh, maybe. That that <laughs> probably makes sense. There's at least a new <laughs> bit of that around. Oh, tell us a bit about your world, Josh. You're far more fascinating than I ever could have realized when you were throwing punches in the gym. Yeah, it's hard to tell when you're just um you're just behind a couple of sixteen ounce you know gloves and, and trying to hiding behind your mouth guard batter people's heads in you know it's it's a bit of yin and yang, um yeah look I, look I'm just a, I'm just a bloke who just you know believes in uh, that people deserve uh, really good help and um so my sort of my life is is and my work is all pointed in the direction of of helping people you know, get the help that they need when they need it as long as they need it regardless of how they come to need help and and sort of bringing people into that process of of um being a part of the solution for for people and communities that are in need and giving them a chance to contribute in, in meaningful ways and obviously at the same time making sure that those those people are getting you know the best standard of, of care and and opportunity that we can we can give them so you know along the way I do all kinds of other bits and pieces and as you know like i've i've um you know, I suppose my resume is a bit of a strange one leading up to, you know, where we are today, but um, yeah, that's that's basically the gist. <laughs> what, are, what are some of the things? Tell us some of the things. Like, what do you want to be when you grew up for a start? Well, yeah, what or I wanted to be. When you grow up. Yeah, what did I want to be? I wanted to be a rock star. Um, of course. But, uh, <laughs> my, yeah, my, my old man was a muso and um, we, didn't, we sort of didn't have any money. So I always thought, ah, oh, you're either super, super... Um, famous or you're broke and it, and it and it's difficult and not good as it turns out you can actually do quite well as a working musician and I did for a little while do that but um, I didn't want to put all my eggs in that basket just because of the sort of obviously high returns if you get to the top but high risk along the way and I wasn't I wasn't prepared for that as a young fella and same with football yeah I wanted to be a footballer and and um, that didn't I wasn't good enough so you know that's what happens um, and uh, so I went to uni but when I was at uni, I also did a trade. So I did an undergraduate degree in, in I did a bachelor of arts with a double major in philosophy and media and communications. And I'm a carpenter uh, by trade as well. I did that at the same time. So um, Hang on, I want to interrupt there. So you chose not to be a rock star because you, because you, because there was potentially no money in it. And then you got a bachelor of arts. 
Yeah, that's why I did a trade too, you know, <laughs> at the same time. Everyone hangs shit on the arts. I tell you. It I is, love the arts. I love is, it. Um, I think everyone everyone should do like at least a year of humanities study. It's it's mm. so in, it's so instructive for it, it's like a multiplier on the other things that you learn. And and I think mm. yeah, okay, so in terms of direct employment outcomes immediately after uni, you're limited a little bit or you or you tend to people tend to go into further study or academia. Um but in terms of what it adds to your capacity to learn through the rest of your life, it's exponential and of course um once you once you have that early days, sort of that law of exponentiality exponentiality means that it is you are learning at a, at a deeper and better rate uh, with more insight and and more tools for the rest of your life, which puts your miles in front of people. And it's funny because when you come out of university, or even when you go in to do an arts degree, and everyone says, "Oh, the you know bachelor of bullshit, a bachelor of you know you don't know what you're doing," you know, blah blah uh-huh. blah. Um, and it's not look, it's not miles off the truth either and are you like yeah has been rich and miserable well but the you. thing is <laughs> up now now that i'm now that i'm you know a long time out of my undergraduate degree um now i bump into people uh all over the place at the top again uh with these kinds of um, backgrounds in education these kinds of undergraduate experiences and so yeah you walk out and maybe you're not great but it levels out again at the top where where you know people with degrees in philosophy or or or, or um, undergraduates in in arts and then have gone on to do other things uh, once again uh, sort of appear to me maybe it's just because I did it so I recognize it but they, they're well represented again sort of back at the top and so yeah it looks in the middle like you know you leave uni and then what are you going to go do there's not a whole lot you're going to be a teacher or you're going to try and study law or something but um, but as a as a fundamental educational experience i think it, it, it's really good and, and, and really valuable but of mm-hmm. course not so good that i didn't do an apprenticeship so that i had a good job as well at the same time <laughs> mm. like i jokingly hang shit on it but if i was to seriously hang shit on anything it would be when we chase material things or when we chase other people's ideas of what success is so it's actually quite the opposite of hang shit worthy in my world yeah. And so much so that I just wrote down humanitarian study on my notebook and will consider that. In yeah, there's lot, there's lots of really great things. You can sort of dip your toe into into studying um, into studying the humanities. There's so many wonderful areas of it. And arts is a weird one because there are little crossovers into into certain areas that people probably find a little bit, they understand a little bit more like your uh, sociologies and your, and your psychologies and mm-hmm. your social sciences and things like that. Um, I mean, obviously, I, I did English and I did archaeology and and all these sorts of things as well in, in in my minors. And it's if you're interested in stuff and you can pay attention for longer than a TikTok, then there is great opportunity in in doing humanity, in studying the humanities because you can, they can, they can be really they can drag you into other things um, mm. and give you really great tools to to learn. Uh, more and learn more deeply from any other discipline as well, I think, which is, which is really good. Mm. Look, I will wholeheartedly say that I've waited the best, the very best part, just a smidgen away from the 40th year before I've been drawn to having a clue of what really interests me in terms of study. I didn't go to uni because I had that TikTok um, attention span. Mm-hmm. I would have been lucky to get through a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so I think, you know, once we understand what, what really grabs us and feeds our, what, what we can be passionate about, that's where it's at. I'm still a baby in the world of academia. You're not even, you're not even halfway through your life. You've got all that again and a little, and some before, you know, hopefully you kick the bucket. So plenty of time to, plenty of time to hit the books and, and do it. And, and you can, yeah, one of the good things about about humanities and and studying the humanities is you can you can start to get some instruction without having to commit to a whole degree. Um, but I think one of the benefits of of doing university or having like a a structured and and uh, sort of focused education in some sense is that it, it holds you accountable to finishing the stuff that you might tap out of if you were bored otherwise. Yeah. People people now I hear a lot of people going oh. I'm doing this course and it's not telling me everything I want to know. So it's shit. And I'm going to, 
I'm going to tap out or whatever. And I just sort of go, well, you've got no idea how useful that's going to be in 10 years because you don't know. And you also don't know what's going to come up. Yeah, you're week six of this course in week 10, there might be the thing that ties it all together or week 12 or week 15. And you don't know. So every time you tap out because you feel like it's not serving you, you're pretending you already know what what you're, tr- what you're actually trying to learn, but you're stepping into the unknown. So part of it is is a commitment to to seeing whole ideas through uh, and out. And then you might reflect on them and go, that was less useful than this other one, or I didn't get as much out of it. But it's also a good practice to just work through things that otherwise you would have tapped out of. So um, it's one of the reasons why I finish books when I start them. And and it's one of the reasons why I, I just spend time with ideas and, and people and things I don't fully agree with all the time. And all of that stuff, it helps it helps create a, a more well-rounded understanding of the world and, and I think makes people feel more comfortable with their own ideas as well. They've got they've put put a bit of sort of rigor into their own thoughts. And I think that that a lot of, a lot of people would benefit from that sort of thing as well. Mm. And just the practice of honing our attention mm-hmm. these days is really important because everything's just pulling at our attention and we're all getting diagnosed with ADHD and we can't sit still and we can't focus and two minutes is too much to put on social media because no one will have the patience to, you know, it's like, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it is. It is a strange sort of um, short attention span economy that we're in at the moment. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think so many things are worse off for it. So yeah, if you, if you want to be the change you want to see, that's a good way to, good way to go about it. Mm. So then what carpentry, what happened next? Yeah, then, uh, so I did that, um, a construction company and, and, uh, was doing you know, pretty well there. And, and that was great, uh, high end sort of in uh, architectural, uh, construction and, uh, some like big renovations. Like when I say renovations, big, big, big renovations. I think the first renovation that I project managed was like a $16 million renovation. So that's all. you say oh, renovation, yeah. but it's basically the scale of a commercial build interact, you know, huge wow. house for these very incredibly wealthy people. And then, mixed use developments and things like that. And I was playing footy and, and doing all that sort of stuff as well. And then I, I was, when I was about 18, 19, I started doing community work as well. So working with at-risk kids predominantly and had grown up in an environment where we did, we're involved in a bunch of community stuff growing up as well. And um, so I was, then I was at working at the PCYC in St Kilda. I was coaching boxing. I was running the, the boxing program there and working with at-risk kids. And then I was sort of was t- tight for time because the construction was going quite well, but I had this weird balance of um, being a tradesperson and also having had a university education in this weird spot where uh, small builders were overextending to take up all this extra work that was around. There was a lot of work. And then big builders were sending people down to do slightly smaller jobs. So sort of between probably like five or six million dollars and like maybe 60 million dollars in that in that realm there it's a bit big for a small builder and it's a bit small for a big builder and you need someone who's got a a strange combination of practical ability to walk around and see what's going on and and know what's happening and and direct traffic that can also deal with the bank and the and the quantity surveyors and the investors and the architects and all that sort of stuff so i end up having this kind of weird little niche role bringing picking jobs up that were running behind on time and and over budget and trying to get them back on track because this was also after the GFC after 2008 credit started getting really tight and lots of builders were going broke too the, the, we hit this period of time where about a dozen a week were just folding and we're probably heading to something similar in the not too distant I would imagine as well and so I was doing all this work it was going really well I had a good team um, but I was really busy and every job demanded that I was part of the deal so I could only ever do probably a maximum of like three jobs at a time. I had people working for me, but I couldn't just be a labor hire company. And I got to this point where I sort of went, you know, fish and chips on the beach taste the same, whether I've got, you know, X amount of money in the bank or zero money. Um, I don't have enough time to do this stuff with the kids that I've been trying to do and, and, and deliver on this work, which has always been sort of the focus of why I do everything is to, to try and improve these opportunities for people. And so I started a clothing company um, with the view that, this I'd be able to actually hand some of the work off in a way that I cannot hand the work off at uh, in construction. And then if I do that, that'll be great. I'll get some more time. I'll point it in that direction. It'll be great. Then I'll have the time to do this other stuff and then blah, 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 blah. So I started a clothing company. We we predominantly sold uh, 
it's called Odin Sports. So sports uniforms and clothes to gyms and all this kind of stuff, like custom gear. We were like very early days doing all the things in CrossFit, which I, you know, I was involved in. And, you know, that still goes. I mean, Odin, Odin is still a thing. Uh, and then after a few years there, uh, I started the Just Be Nice project, which was basically after a bunch of um, a bunch of sort of time working out what does the best setup look like, what does the best framework look like to uh, engage people in this in this process of helping people, and and what is the best kind of form of support for people in need, and and um, started JBN about nine years ago, been doing that ever since, and you know in and amongst all of that, a little bit of working in bars and a little bit of random jobs here and there and all that kind of stuff too, but. Um, uh, that's kind of been been the gist, and and JBN has put me in lots of different places all over the world, doing all kinds of different interesting work and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just about to finish uni again uh, in a couple of weeks for the second time. I'm just finishing a master's up at the moment as well. So, bloody hell, you've lived a few lifetimes already. Yeah, I feel like I tell the I tell stories like this, and then like someone says something, I go, oh yeah, I did that too, but I like, I can't ever remember it all because. <laughs> I'm sort of a forward looking person. I don't really, I'm really terrible at remembering how long ago things were. My timelines all overlap because I'm often doing yeah. three or four things at once. So like just I find it really hard to remember mind. when stuff finishes. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around a, a sub 20 year old managing a $16 million construction project. Yeah, it was a funny one. I went to the boss and I just said, listen, man, you, you, your site manager sucks. He's terrible. Um, <laughs> I remember him, he was terrible. And and shout uh, out to you bro shout out to that terrible guy well shout out to andrew who i had lunch with on friday actually who's the guy who's who i walked into so this was a long time ago we're still very close in fact he was probably about my age now then um now now he's older obviously um but um i walked in and, and he sort of he had this setup he had a couple of young kids uh they, they had this lovely house in, in hampton he was driving a hilux and they had they were doing this job and I went into him one day and I just said, listen, man, that's the, that's the, that's the setup. What do I got to do? Um, what do I got to do to be a part of this? Cause you know, I, I, I can't, you know, I can be useful, Wh whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. And then I'd said, you know, the, the site manager sucks. And then the site manager went away and then he said, all right, well, you want to do this? And I said, absolutely. Let's go. So just got stuck in and that was pretty much it. And over the years we looked after each other doing all kinds of things. And then, you know, worked with other people. I did a little stint where just Keith from the block and I were working together before he got on the block and all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, that, that was kind of the, that was a, that was how that all kicked off. And it sounds like a big deal, but these are huge projects with lots of people. So you've got lots of redundancies built into the expertise of everyone around you and, and, managing something um of that size requires requires a humility that i probably benefited from being young and and having that sort of naturally just by virtue of inexperience not because of my my character i'm not i'm not someone who's like a shy retiring person but just because i knew i was inexperienced you have to lean on the experience of people around you yeah. you have to learn how to be you know in your 20s telling guys in their 40s late 40s um, who have been doing their job a long time, what to do and when to do it. And and so I really benefited from all of that. And I think it made me very, very good at my job because I could I could really uh, tell when when it was time to listen and when it was time to put your foot down. And when, when do I really know what needs to happen? When am I certain? And when do I need to go, actually, this bloke knows what he's talking about. If we've got, we'll, I'll rejig the plan around what his advice is because he's, he's onto it. So um, it all in the end, it all worked out quite well. You just sound like such a natural learner, like you're never being the boss looking to learn. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> How many people you've do got that? to be. You've got to be. <laughs> you cannot be an expert on all the things. Yeah. Uh, you, you and and learning how to manage and coordinate things and and pull people together is is an expertise that benefits from knowing lots about what's happening, but also one of the like on the on the Dunning Kruger curve. You know, the the less you know, the more you think you know. So the more you know, the more you're aware of where your blind spots are. And, and that, I think, makes it easier to go, yeah, actually, that's something I, I couldn't, I can't go to town arguing with you about that. So I'll, I'll defer to you in this in this case and and remember if you got it wrong, because then I won't do it again. But, you know, that's that's part of the deal. And, and your responsibility is to take responsibility for those decisions of when to listen and when to press a bit harder. So, yeah, it's 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 analogous to the same stuff that I'm doing now and and 
the, you know, playing any team sport, doing any kind of thing like that, I think yeah. uh, you, you, you're better if you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Tell us about Just Be Nice. Yeah. I mean, what do you want, what do you want to know is, uh, how did it start? What was the plan? What does it look like? Yeah. How did well, it evolve? The, what was hard? The, the, I guess it started out of a frustration that people don't get good help, that so many people are left behind and that there is so much goodwill and there are so many resources uh, in the world. How, how people don't get all the help that they need has always just sort of baffled me. And this idea that for s- somehow on, on very arbitrary reasons, uh, for, some people don't deserve help. And for me, fundamentally, I just don't think that's true. And I think that that people do deserve help. I think everyone deserves a good opportunity and I, and that it's a lot of the times not someone's fault, not wholly someone's fault that they find themselves in difficulty. So where can we where can we alleviate that? How can we improve opportunity? And so really, it started from going right back to the beginning and going, okay, we've got an outcome that we want to work towards, which is that people are, are okay. You know, what does that look like? What does okay look like? What's the goal? Um, is this something that we can, can we build something that makes sense in every uh, geographic, political, economic sort of context? It's got to be something that doesn't just work in one suburb for one group of people in one context in Australia, mm. because What's the point? That's no good. Um, it's got to be something that can be adapted. It's got to be dynamic enough to be adapted wherever you are. And so that that was basically the premise. And and a lot of work on my end went into establishing frameworks for measuring impact and understanding what the challenges are with how people look at it. What what are the structural things that make it make it difficult? Whether it's cultural, whether it's in in people's ideas about profits and non profits, whether it's in the economic expectations globally and, and in countries what what are, what do those look like what are people's expectations about help what are people's experiences with giving help and getting help and what do people expect when they have good intentions and they try and do something versus what actually happens why is the communication so off why why are we in a place where people can be so unaware uh, of how to do a good job of looking after people and you've really got to go through everything with a fine tooth comb and answer all these questions before, bef- like before JBN even started, and that's something that's um, unusual in the space of helping people because it is one of the very few places where you can start with no real concept about what you're doing and no expertise, and just roll straight into it, and people will not will applaud you and give you money on the spot. Um, there are many industries like that, and the my. In, in this particular industry, the the reason that that bothers me so much is because there are often people on the other end of that that get poor help, help or get shitty outcomes because of that. So I really wanted to make sure that we could cover all bases and sit down and go through the million questions that people might have about it. And also to identify the problems that exist in the system, not just what problems do people have, but what are the problems in the systems of help that we have around them so that we can address them fully and comprehensively and just get it done. And so that that's kind of how it all came together. And once the, once those frameworks were sort of done and all that work had sort of been put in and we'd sort of done some little bits of, you know, working around and doing small scale stuff, then started JBN and started the mission of getting everybody involved to try and build up enough resources so that ultimately the end goal is people will be able to call JBN and they, for whatever reason they need a hand, we'll just be able to chop them out, pick them up, pick them up and take them where they need to be. And um, however long that takes, we'll be there and whatever their challenge is, we'll be able to deal with it. And so ultimately that's that's the end goal. But you know, we're miles off that at the moment. In the interim, it's about you know, gathering gathering more support and getting more people on board and mm-hmm. helping people with their impact literacy and understanding along the way. So who who is JBN helping? What does that look like? And how did you decide what people in need for JBN would look like? Yeah, so basically we had to pick an outcome that we wanted for people that would be approximate to to setting them up for an equality of opportunity that we aspire for everyone to have. And again, because it's important that this is something that can be applied wherever we are, uh, where we landed on that was that they were housed, that they were employed, 
and that they had good mental health. So that was because their aspirations we can have for people everywhere on the planet. Um, and in those, there is uh, there is complexities. So housing, you know, there are conditions on it that we want it to be adequate. We want it to be accessible. We want the amenity to be good. We want it to be affordable. And we want it to be long-term and secure, all that kind of stuff. So it's not just a place, regardless of what it looks like. There are, there are conditions on that. Um, we want it to be, we want people to be part of a community and, and have community connections for their physical and mental health. And so that ties into the housing outcomes, not relocating people sort of willy nilly, just because we have a house over here. You live in Frankston. I've got a house in Point Cook. We demand that you move into Point Cook or you won't get another, you know, you won't get another opportunity. And that's, that's what happens. It happens a lot. And it happens overseas too, when they relocate entire sort of slum areas or favelas or um, redevelop old buildings and things like that. Uh, and so that is 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 not ideal. Uh, employed, look, in, the employment piece is an interesting one, but people being employed means that they're making a living wage or that they're able to support themselves or others in, in that position. We're looking to change also a little bit of the definition of employment to get more value placed on things that traditionally aren't considered employment. So if you're someone who is perhaps doing care work for your family members, the housework that you might be doing, you're looking after the kids and things like that, it's a it's it's a bit two edged in that we can revalue kinds of employment that exist that are currently undervalued in that space, and so make sure that people are fairly compensated, remunerated, and supported for those kinds of jobs. So that's really important. And then the other thing is to make sure that people have access to really good jobs, and make sure the jobs are good, the conditions are good, people have access to them. And in terms of people having access to them, the the uh, employment piece for us that runs all the way back down to um, education and and sort of you know, in utero support of, of people who are about to have kids so that the kids are born and they have access to as many opportunities to try as many things, learn as many things, find the things that they're really good at, lean into those aptitudes and, and find gainful employment at the end. And the gainful employment at the end as well, working with businesses is making sure that they're getting people who are engaged, who are well supported, who can show up and do a great job, who are well trained and understand the job. So, you know, we say jobs, but it's kind of employment, but it's it's kind of like there is complexity in that process, uh, and that's really important. And then good mental health also picks up, you know, good physical health outcomes as well along the way. Good communal uh, community attachments and and relationships. Um, avenues to contribution for people so we're addressing things like isolation and addiction and um, it's not about saying we're trying to get rid of bad days for everyone I think bad days are a necessary part of life and they're going to happen but making sure people aren't uh, left isolated and 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 on their own making sure people aren't being overly um, disrupted by you know, problems of addiction, making sure they have access to all the psychological and psychiatric care that they might need and, and medication, if that's the case, support, if that's the case, time, if that's the case, and making sure that none of those challenges result in them sort of losing any, losing out on any of the other important things. So once you're housed, employed and have good mental health outcomes, you know, then from there, you can kind of go and do whatever in your life. You've got lots of opportunities to do things. But if we sort of only do one or two of those things, then they're every chance of like losing them. If, you, if you're housed and employed, but your mental health's poor, you're a huge chance to lose your job and then lose your house and go backwards. If your mm. mental health's pretty good and you're employed, but you don't have anywhere to live, limited time before your mental health is going to suffer and then your employment is going to suffer because you've got nowhere to live. If your um, mental health is good and you've got somewhere to live and you don't have a job, okay, that's probably the ideal person to try and find work in some context, but it's only a matter of time of not having work before all of a sudden you're unable to, you're homeless essentially. And then, you know, we know that the negative mental health impacts that that has. So doing all three, it is important that we do all three. It's important that we do them in the right order for each individual person and to meet them where they are and bring them up to speed, um, get them where they need to be uh, in, in an order and with the support that is relevant to them. So who we would help is literally anyone who is struggling with any one or two or three of those things. And in communities, it's about removing barriers to access and barriers to support into those outcomes. So on a community-wide level, it's about making looking over the whole situation and going, is there adequate housing and opportunity and affordability and all this sort of stuff? Same with mental health, same with education and 
and uh, employment outcomes. And if there isn't, then we're going to look community-wide at how to address those things. And for individuals, it's about picking them up where they are and taking them through to the end. And we currently operate on a referral system. So people, we have partners in the communities uh, and, and in businesses and things like that. They've been given from us a number of ways to identify people who might need a hand. They'll call us and say, hey, I've got this um, woman, her name's Tiffany. Uh, she lives Bayside. This is what's happening. Can you help her? We get a little bit of a rundown. You don't know they've called. That's part of the deal sort of thing. And then if we can, we say, yeah, absolutely. Um, get it, like Give her our details and I will get in touch if she's okay with it. Let me know if that's okay. And if it is, then we'll, we'll get in touch and we'll start that process. And the reason we do it by referral is because we have to say no sometimes where we don't have the resources to help people. And saying no to people who've reached out to help is one of the great blockers to people reaching out to help again. And so we really don't want that to be the case. Yeah. Um, but ideally, what we would like in the future is to be so well supported with so many resources that it doesn't matter. Anyone can call up and, and we're confident we'll be able to pick you up and, and take you where you need to be. So that's, um, I guess, in a a massive nutshell. That's kind of the deal. <laughs> yeah. I remember last time we spoke about, I guess when we think we're doing, we think we're helping, but we're actually not talk a bit about that. Cause that I, th I feel like everyone, you know, we often think throwing a dollar here at someone or, mm. or getting, getting this flush of emotions about it, listening down going, I want to go and help. I'm going to go do this or that. Like talk yeah. a little bit about the effects of that. Cause that was powerful. Yeah, there's a few there's a few things that I think people need to know. One is that um, helping people is a, is an ex, it's an expertise. It's, it requires a level of expertise that you you don't have. I'm just going to say you don't have it because you probably don't have it. Um, you may have been told a million times that you know what's going on from all the advertising that's on the telly, but it is at least as complicated as open heart surgery. That's that's what I tell people, and you need to know that. If you, first of all, if you don't believe that, then you definitely don't have the skills So, and you don't know. And if you do believe that and you're frustrated constantly and unable to deliver that kind of help and, and don't have a clear pathway, you're on the right track probably, but you also don't have those skills. There's actually very few places to develop those skills. It requires an incredible amount of patience and there aren't organizations trying to solve complete problems that way where they take responsibility and coordinate and deliver those outcomes. It's just, there's just nowhere to learn that um, really. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. And then so people say things like, isn't it better to start somewhere? Shouldn't we start somewhere? And when they say that, they mean finding a person or a place that's suffering a very visible kind of disadvantage and trying to do something for them. And absolutely, we need to stop talking about we're needing to start somewhere we need to finish somewhere we it sounds strange to people but there is not consensus about the outcomes that we want for people period here or anywhere else we every day we make political and cultural decisions to leave people homeless to leave people without clothes to leave people without food not only in australia but all over the world to leave people in harm's way daily right now in the world, we have enough food and enough places for people to stay and enough you know, opportunity to deliver medical care and all these things. We could, we could solve those problems today and we choose not to. It is a choice that we make because we do not fundamentally all agree that everyone should have those outcomes. Not, not because we don't think, oh, it'd be nice if everyone's housed, but because we, we prioritize a million other things in front of it our own kids' well-being, our own families, our own access to owning 200 properties or five properties or even three properties or whatever it is, you know, that I need to, you know, protect my investments, that the market needs to decide all of these things. So we've already made that decision. And until we can agree that everyone deserves these outcomes, then starting somewhere is one of the most dangerous things for people who are really suffering complex long-term and 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 deep struggles because it is so hard as a human to reach out for help to have someone empathize with you as a human and then them do a little bit of something and then go away or the help runs out or they run out of time or they run out of interest or you make a small mistake or a big mistake, and then they go, "That's it. They write you off forever. You can't. You're you're irredeemable now. We're not going to help you." 
once you've been through that process once, maybe twice, people with kids will reach out. They will, they will be put through these humiliating circumstances of just, you know, essentially being made to grovel, being made to, you know, go through these, jump through these hoops just to get support. And in aid of their children and their families, people do it. And it breaks my heart to see them do it. Uh, but then you see people who are just looking for the help for themselves and they tend to tap out because it's too much. It's too heartbreaking and better to re retain some agency in your life and not engage with a system that is prepared to like just keep kicking you while you're down. And we wonder why people don't engage with half-assed interventions. We see it in in community-wide interventions and we see it in the way that the government and lots of organisations interact with First Nations communities here and, and overseas. Um, but we also see it with, with people who have been sort of let down by the system a lot and then they just start to interact with it in a way that serves them based on what they can see and they can access within their own agency. And that is the most inefficient way to leave people in harm's way. It's usually very expensive. It's very dangerous and people suffer. So we have to agree. We want people to get this outcome. Once we agree that, then we can agree on the best ways to get there. And that means saying some stuff is not great. So again, you're in this, but we, not all help is equal. Not all intentions are equal. Absolutely not all expertise is equal. And so if I've got a thousand dollars, a million dollars, 50 bucks, I can put it towards something that's good. Sure. But it's also very easy to put it towards something that doesn't do much at all. And in this space of fundraising and all these sorts of things, there's a lot of stuff out there that doesn't do much at all. So not to be all doom and gloom and say you can't do anything, but the trick is to start by by making sure the people close to you that you understand well, that you have deep trusting relationships with, making sure that they're okay and engaging in in the process of being a part of their assistance in a way that you can sustain for as long as they might need it on and off um, until everyone around you is okay, making sure that they're feeling connected, they've got avenues to connection and, and contribution, that their housing is okay, that their bills are paid, that they're not struggling with money, that they're not um, feeling isolated, that they're not stressed out of their mind or, or suffering from drug and alcohol addiction, that that their employment is gainful and that it is um, paying a living wage and they're okay. All of these sorts of things sounds like a lot, but that's, that's the bare minimum. And if you start by working with people or talking to people and being a good friend, essentially a good friend, good family member, then once you've been doing that for years, you start to get a real understanding of the complexities that are involved with helping people. And then you start to build some ideas about how to look around at things and go, all right, well, this is what's missing. Once you take that experience and then you turn that aspiration for the people you care about the most into the same aspirations for people you don't know, we'll be able to move the needle a lot better policy decisions will get better. You'll vote for better people, all these kinds of things. And, um, and then people will start moving towards being able to get the help that they need when they need it. But until then, there's a lot of, there's a lot of inefficiencies and there's a lot of misguided good intentions. And I don't blame anybody for that. The system teaches you poorly how to do that, but that's just un the unfortunate reality at the moment of, of what helping and, and getting help and giving help looks like. Mm. And I think we're all, we're all of these biases built in and, so I live in Elwood, so I'm in this little community bubble and there's been a few times in the Facebook page, community Facebook page I've seen people complaining about the riffraff around St Kilda, you know, the streets or the homeless and the things that are said like truly rip my heart out and I just think um, like how do we... The other thing I was going to say is, under, like the conditional, I don't even know how to word it. The condition, like the conditional giving. So when we, you know, I'd give the, I won't give them money because they'll buy this or that. Like we think, we're, so if we're going to give a homeless person money on the street, and we think they're not going to spend it on what we think they should spend it on, like we don't, we're not willing to give it to them. But then we, when we're choosing some other avenue of making ourselves feel good in inverted commas because we're doing something for charity. It's all about us having this this feeling, this emotion, like I'm helping, I'm this, this with no, like you said, looking into what is this company doing, what's the outcome, what's, you know? Yeah. 
Well, I people think... people don't have the tools really to understand what organizations are doing, which is a, which is a challenge. It's something I try and address, and I teach people about it. When when you look at someone who's sleeping rough, or you look at someone who's running around being a bit of a rat bag, you've got to. You talking about me? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> talk about me, I tell you. Talk about me. Talk about my mates. You know, when we, you know, we've we've been through it, and it, someone who's sleeping on the street, they they are by definition, they are making what the that is the best decision that they can make. People people don't make the third best decision for themselves. They make the best decision on the balance of all the things that are happening to them. They say, "What's the best decision I can make? What's my best? What's the best thing I can do right now?" And so when you see someone in that circumstance, you're not going to understand it all. If, oh, I'm going to sit down and chat to them and whatever. Okay, great, cool. You're going to treat them well, treat them nicely, be nice to people, and then understand that that's their best option. And then think about what are we doing that has made a world and a society and a pocket of this very affluent suburb and this very affluent city in a very affluent country with amazing infrastructure where the best option for this guy is to sleep on the street or this woman is the best is to sleep on the street mm. if what would your other options have to look like for that to be your best one yeah. and that would be there would be terrible options and so for instance you have people who are absolutely not okay in a million different ways and so it's just easier for them to manage because people don't want to manage them in in various places where sometimes there's temporary housing we have a system where there's temporary housing that they run out of and so they don't want to go in and out it's just easier to settle into life on the street even though it's horrendous um we have people come out of drug and alcohol rehab and a lot of the rooming houses which house a lot of people that are uh, say homeless for instance uh, the rooming houses are you know that are harm minimization facilities which is great I, I i fully agree with it with a harm minimization approach but when you've just come out of rehab um you don't want to go into a place where people are using so again your best option is the street and that's not because you're a terrible person or you're not trying to get on top of things or whatever but how, it is hard to build your life up from the street of course of the homelessness problem the rough sleepers, the one you see on the street, are the very pointy end and the smallest number of homeless people. There are a lot of people in insecure housing. There are a lot of people couch surfing. There are a lot of people who um, um, have to move constantly because you know of, of the nature of their lack of stable housing. And so if you're going, oh, what I need to do is buy this guy a big M, put it on Instagram, tell everyone I'm a great guy. But then when someone says, oh, we, we should probably get rid of the um, capital gains uh sort of tax concessions that we have on investment properties, you kick off, then you're making the wrong choice. That but that chocolate milk is doing much less than if we address the fact that there are investment, pro like there are property investment people that are heavily incentivized to have empty homes, to just mm -hmm. drive rents up constantly, to do these sorts of things that, that create a system and a, and a situation that leaves people behind. And, when people go, oh, well, why should we have to pay for homeless people? Like that's their choice. For for the only, this is one number of one thing, of one economic consideration, one policy decision. But the capital gains concessions that we have on properties cost us in the vicinity of 10 to $13 billion a year. We subsidize as a country, we already subsidize those people with investment properties. They're the people that are getting subsidized. So for 13, 10, 13 billion dollars a year, everyone's housed. No question. In the first year, they're probably housed. It's but we're subsidizing people with investment properties to that number every year. And we don't go, oh, but what are they going to do with it? They're going to buy drugs with it. Of course they are. Of course, heaps of them are, you know. <laughs> but they're buying drugs and they're going to the footy. They're buying drugs and they're at Star Casino with, you know, Wayne Carey. You know, <laughs> we don't judge them the same. You know, they're buying booze. Of course they are. Just they're buying, you know. $70 bottles of Craigley Shiraz instead of, you know, bottle, you know, boxes of goon. And that's fine. I've got no problem with people buying stuff. I don't mind how people live their lives, but let's not pretend that we're not subsidizing the lives of people with investment properties mm. to the tune of $10 billion a year when, while there are homeless people. And so 
if we just treated housing as a as a human right first, as opposed to an investment vehicle, it would it wouldn't take away the opportunity to invest in property, and it wouldn't take away the opportunity to make some money in it and do these things. But what it would do is say that no one can do any of that until everyone's got a bloody reasonable place to live because in a country as wealthy with as much infrastructure and opportunity as Australia, it is unconscionable that we have people that can't afford their housing and that there there are empty houses and those sorts of things. And when people go, where's the money coming from? Well, where's the money coming from to subsidize these bloody property investors? It's coming from us. And I, for one, would rather subsidize people who are in need. Uh, and I think, you know, given the opportunity, a lot of people would until they have an investment property and go, oh, but I've been banking on this, you know, capital gains concession, mm -hmm. which is only on investment properties because you don't pay capital gains on your place of residence. So if you've just got one place, you don't pay capital gains on it. If you live in it, live in your home, you know, Australian dream, whatever, American dream, own your home, live in it, fantastic, power to you. Mm -hmm. But on investment properties, the investment property subsidies cost us billions of dollars every year. And so, you know, they'd, in just one tiny little example, that if you're someone who's like, I'm going to give this guy a, a big M and then vehemently scream at any politician that even hints at perhaps addressing uh, capital, uh, you know, capital gains concessions, it, then for me, it's already backwards. And my job is to try and help you understand why that's the case, um, you know, along the way. Yeah, it's that conditional thinking. It's that thinking that, that I'm better because I'm not in the position. I remember watching Filthy Rich and Homeless and I had Tim guest on this show after that because um, just watching watching him go from those pre-show interviews where he was like, you know, if I hit hard times, I just get myself back up, I'll create it again, meh, meh, meh. And then next minute he's out on the street and he's crying and he's like, I didn't, I didn't we don't understand until we're thrust, you know, we don't understand the impacts of, the human condition when we're disconnected in fear, cold, hungry, tired, and well, I mean, the that's, the, that's the classic example. So filthy rich and philanthropist is like how it mostly goes. We have these galas, the rich people put money in. These are the same people who are incapable of looking at a person who's homeless and understanding that sucks. Why the hell did you need to go on a TV show and bloody do it to even recognize that that was terrible? <laughs> like how, where are we at where that's where people are at? Like, how is that even possible? It's the most ludicrous thing to say, walk past a homeless person and not get that that sucks. You know, mm. like, why did you even need to do that? Why do you need to go and do the uh, away from home documentary? Like, how is it that we have these people who can't, who are literally incapable of understanding these other contexts. And these are the people that make decisions about where they put their money and what charities. And then, so when people say, oh, well, I know what I'm doing, I go, okay, cool. But like, also you loved that doco where this guy had to go and pretend like it's normal that you need to pretend that before you realize it sucks. Like that's insane to me. Mm. Where are you at that you need to go and sleep on the street to realize that sucks? What is wrong with you? <laughs> and then why on earth would I as someone looking for looking for support, looking for funding, you're going to make me pitch you about why you should help JBN. Mate, you needed to go lie on the street to work out homelessness sucks. I don't want to talk to you about it. You're incapable of understanding this in this context. You know, first, first and foremost, you should, before I even ask if you want to do JBN stuff, you should be saying, Josh, teach me about what's going on in the world with people before I even make one decision about what kind of social impact I want to have because I'm so clueless that I don't even know that being homeless sucks. Get a grip. You know, it's insane. The disconnect to me, it's just like, I don't know how, I don't know how people think that's all normal and okay. It's insane to me. Oh, we need a TV show about it. You don't need a TV show about it. People need to get their heads, you know, out of their own ass and pay attention to the world and just go, yeah, actually that makes sense. It makes sense that it would suck to be a child in Syria. It makes sense that it would suck to be a woman in uh, Afghanistan now. It makes sense that it would suck to be in Pakistan after 60% of the country has just been ravaged with floods. It would. It, it, it sucks to be a Uyghur in China. It sucks to be, you know, in in uh, Spain during a drought. It's like, do we need to go and be like, 
oh, filthy rich and pretending to be in Pakistan or filthy rich and pretending to raise, raise kids in a war-torn Aleppo or filthy rich and living in, in Beirut next to the port where everything's blown up and we haven't had power for seven months. Oh, it's actually kind of hard without power. Like, get a, of course it's hard. You know, of course it's hard. Like, so so let's skip all that stupid stuff and let's go to the bit where we go, filthy rich and actually gets that everyone, that you're not rich because you're special and you've done all these wonderful things that filthy rich and super lucky and everyone else deserves to, at the very least, mm-hmm. have these housing, employment and good mental health outcomes and, and food and amenity and power and access to education, all of these things that you had that set you up for some monetary gain in your life. And if you don't believe that, you have no business pretending you've got any clue about what it means to actually do good, give, be a philanthropist, engage in social impact, et cetera, et cetera, because you're clueless. Mm. What I see is that the hardest thing that you guys must do is how do you take someone, so you mentioned before that social social connections, one of the biggest in community. How do you, how do you take someone who's encompassed in, a community that obviously has trauma and mental health and challenges and nurture that connection without taking them out of that, like you said, taking them away from that, which is we don't want to do, but how do, how do you manage that? Sometimes, yeah, nurture is a great word. I, I think nurture is, 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 is part of the deal. We split our help up into two major kinds when we want to talk about stuff like this. One is human help and one is logistics. The human help element is the people around someone or a community that are there to provide support and encouragement to for them to lean on. Um, you know, it's, it's your best friend. It's your mum. It's those people that are providing a very human support and connection to you as a person as you move through whatever challenges you're moving through the logistics are all the things that we need that you need to move through uh, with the human help so the easiest example is if if i was unfortunate enough to uh, need chemotherapy touch wood and i said oh um tiff can you come with me to my chemo and you 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 know you're a good friend and you say absolutely that's of course i will and, and we go the logistics of my treatment are taken care of by the hospital, by a series of oncology doctors and nurses, by Peter Mack, by all of the industry that provides the chemotherapy drugs, the radiation therapies, the various equipments, by the people who fund and support the whole infrastructure that is the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to be in there and across my eight courses, we're going to meet 27 nurses, four doctors. I'm going to have 70 bags of stuff put through my body, blah, 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 blah. 15 people are going to make my bed. 50 people are going to make my meals, all this kind of stuff. So this is the logistics. This is all the people that are going to do all those things. And they're going to change. There's going to be some continuity. I might keep meeting the same doctor for things, but I'm also going to have bad days. So your job as the human help is you're going to say, we've got to go. And I'm going to go, I don't want it. Like I'm sick. I'm just going to die. And you go, you're not going to die. Let's go. You know, it's tough and it's horrible. And I'm going to, you know, lose my hair and you're going to shave your head and I'm going to be sick and you're going to tap my back and my tongue's going to, the skin's going to fall off and you're going to get me ice water. You're not an expert. You don't know what the hell's going on in terms of the treatment. You don't need to know about cancer. You don't need to know about radiotherapy. You don't need to know about the drugs really, you know, you will have a passing understanding of what's going on from talking to people. But then perhaps one day I'm like passed out The doc, when the doctor comes past and he goes, oh, how's it going? He said, well, this week he's been super, super crook. He's been throwing up every day. He's been feeling really down. He's lost a lot of weight. And the doctor goes, because he's the expert, he goes, all right, we're going to do 30% of this less. We're going to do 20% of this more and we're going to give him this. And then we're going to have an extra week off in the middle because you're going to need that extra time to recover because I'm the expert. I know what's going on. I'm going to do this and I'm going to prescribe that. I was asleep. I didn't really hear any of that. You're just there holding my hand. It's the human ho- The human help becomes a great conduit to understanding of where that person is when they're at their worst, when they're at their most vulnerable, when they're at their, at their biggest struggle. But it's got to go to someone who knows what to do and knows what's available to start dealing with it. And then I wake up and you go, they're going to do this and hopefully you're going to get an extra week off and then we're going to try and feel good. And I go, okay, righto, fuck. I've got another two treatments or whatever. Let's Let's go, let's go, right? And I'm going to stumble and fall and cry and be a mess and not want to do it. And you're going to be there and you're going to help and you're going to hold my hand and do all those things. It's the same if we're trying to deal with a problem that isn't cancer. 
It can be anything else. I'm trying to get trained up to go to work. I'm going to not want to go. I'm going to have the bad days. I'm going to want to leave early. I'm going to feel like shit. I'm going to be too tired. I'm going to not know what I'm doing. I'm going to get embarrassed. I'm going to say the wrong thing. I'm going to, I'm going to drop a plate. I'm going to, you know, put a nail in the wrong spot. I'm going to hurt myself at work. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to have a shitty boss. And you're going to, you're part of the human help that start that says, all right, I don't really know how to train you. I don't know all these skills you need. I don't know where we're going to place you for work, but I'm going to be this support that helps you move through the rehab, the education, the training, the work experience, the work, the first days, the seventh days, whatever. And so between them, what we're able to do at JBN is identify where the gaps are. Does this person have human support around them and is it reliable and good? What does it look like? And then do they have the logistical access that they need as well? If you're missing, it, one of the funny things is, it's not really funny, but one of the one of the strange things is in resource-rich environments, they often have a lot of the logistical access to stuff, the things they need, the money, the material support, and less time to do the human help. And then in in resource poor areas, they often have a lot of time to be human assistance to help care, community, friends, whatever, and less access to the logistics they need to help themselves, which is another reason why you can't have one size fits all approaches to anything because they don't work. It might also be the case that you have a couple of people, maybe a couple, maybe a couple of friends who are supporting each other, but are also at risk and require other external support because they themselves are both going through a process of being supported into being helped. And so you've got to find that gap. You got, and to deal with that, one thing that is never spoken about in any kind of context, because people don't want to pay for it, no one really cares about it, no one understands the importance of it, is that trust is fundamentally one of the most important things for to start off any impact intervention with any personal community anywhere. If there is no trust, they do not. They people tend to not lean into the interventions. They don't lean into the help, and they don't tend to get better. They don't listen, and it takes a long time to build that trust. You can short track that by letting people who are already there supporting people, giving them support as the human help, and providing them with logistical support and perhaps support for themselves uh, along the way, or. You have to take the time to build that trust with someone if they are in that really toxic environment, if they are in that, if they really are in harm's way and and they may need to move out of that environment because it is impossible to get better there. And that happens. It's it's sometimes you do need to move people away from their old friends who um are still not ready to go and not ready to change. You know, um they're living in a house where everyone's using and it's a nightmare and yeah, it's very hard to be the only person who's sober in a house of people that are using and they might be your oldest and dearest friends and family, but you, you, you need to move away from that environment to be able to be treated properly. But we can't leave that gap there of human support. And so you have to be paired up with someone or it might be a social worker, it could be another friend, it could be someone from AA or NA, it could be, you know, your drug and alcohol counsellor, you might need extra counselling, whatever that looks like, that human help needs to be there. And what that does is smooth out this process of all the different other iterations of help that you need to go through logistically to actually get where you need to be. So that's how we kind of keep track of it all. We make sure that people have human help and make sure that people have the logistics in front of them. And that works for individuals and it works for communities. And in a sort of macro sense, helps us identify some of those gaps pretty quickly. Mm. You're very passionate. I love it. I love it. <laughs> um, for anyone listening or everyone listening, what, what is your advice on a call to action? What do you want people to, if they are like, I really love, I'd love to support either just be nice or the issue at hand, what is your, what can they do? My, my advice is always to start by looking after the people close to you. That's always step one. Um, you've got the trust there. You've got the understanding hopefully of them and their lives. Um, if you don't have the understanding of help, you know, that's somewhere where that, yeah, that, we can help with as well. Um, obviously, we we love and and are grateful for all the help that we get at JBN. And you can just head to jbnproject.com and and um, you know you can support us there in a bunch of different ways. Put your hand up to do some stuff, buy some things from the affiliated shops, all that kind of thing. Um, and generally speaking, I think it's about it's about taking the time to respect the fact that helping people. Um, takes time and effort and be patient with it 
and be patient with what you want to see in the world for in that space and take the time to have better, longer conversations with people, engage with ideas more fully and be be a good person to be around um, because those things, they do matter and it's really hard to just jump in and start helping people. You can't, just like you couldn't, if you, you, you the example I always give, give is if, you'd heard me play the cello and it and it broke your heart and it was amazing and you were so inspired, you wouldn't think you could just run out and play the cello. You'd go, all right, I need lessons. You need yeah. lessons in help and you can't get them from ads. You're probably not going to get them from the from the largest um, non-profits because they don't, they don't benefit from people knowing more about it. Um, but if you do want to learn about it, if you want your workplace to be better, if you've got a if you've got a business that you want to get them involved with doing things, that's what we do. We go in and and identify all the ways that an, an organization can help and integrate into that and identify the resources that are useful and integrate it in a way that gives people the best chance to participate in helping people doing what they're good at, which is ideally where everyone should be helping. Don't look for some little transactional bit of help that you think you can just do and be like, oh, this is going to be my purpose. If someone asks you to do something like, yeah, sure, chop them out. But um, the best help you're going to be able to give people is always going to be on the end of what you're really good at and people very rarely only need one kind of help. So the more time you spend looking after the people around you, the better understanding you get of that. Have the same aspirations for everyone all over the world that you have for the people you care about the most. And um, yeah, if you've got any other sort of questions or anything, you can obviously hit us up or, you know, read the bazillions of blogs and articles I've written over the years and, you know, get in touch and we can we can come out and, and sort of teach people impact literacy and get people involved as well. Ooh, impact literacy. I love that. Uh, you've got a podcast. What is it? Give it a plug. Oh, fuck. I don't even what, what I call it, Random Acts of Conversation. It's pretty intermittent. It's just when interesting people are around and I can grab them. I'm not as structured as you guys. You're all very organized. I just sort of go, oh, you know, Joe's in town. You want to come have a chat? And then uh, <laughs> then we do that because my work is pretty chaotic. So um, it's not a regular one, but there's an older one, an older JVN one. I think there's 20 or 30 episodes there too. And you know, I'm obviously I write stuff on Instagram and do those sorts of things and LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, you can follow on along in all of those sort of ways that um, we've got to we've got to maintain in this day and age. Brilliant. I'll have uh, your website and links in the show notes. Thanks so much, Josh. And hey, everyone, just be nice. Just be nice, guys. Thanks for having me, Tip. Cheers. <laughs>